Hi, this is Chuck Stull, continuing our discussion of the technology industry by looking at software. Let me return to the startup that worked to develop IBM software uh, for the personal computer. If you look at this picture, you may be able to pick out a couple of familiar faces. In the very lower left corner is a young Bill Gates. And in the right center with the heavy dark beard um, is Paul Allen. And for many of you, you will recognize those names. And for all of you, I'm sure you'll recognize the company that they formed. And that's Microsoft, a name very, very familiar today. Now, Microsoft modified another small firm software with help from IBM engineers in order to create MS-DOS, um, the operating system for the IBM PC. And this is in 1981. As we saw in our last video, IBM PC sales boomed um, and there was a growth of IBM compatibles. And that eventually led to some contract renegotiations between IBM, who was far and away the dominant player in the computer industry at that time, and Microsoft, this young new startup. So the real question was who owns MS-DOS? The operating system for the popular PC. Um, and both companies had some claims to it. As a result of the negotiation, IBM got the right to use MS-DOS for its own machines without paying Microsoft anything. And remember, IBM had 85% of the PC market at this point, so IBM thought that they won, um, won that negotiation. Um, but Microsoft did get something, Microsoft had the ability to collect royalties from the other computer manufacturers who use MS-DOS. And again, this is a small percent of the overall market. Um, but it turned out to be very important because the microcomputer industry was very different from mainframes. One of the things that was important about microcomputers is there was essentially no barriers to entry. Any firm who wanted to produce computers could buy chips from Intel and software from Microsoft, and many firms did. IBM quickly lost market share to new entrants and found it could not maintain its dominance, and it eventually exited the PC business. Uh, in 2005, it sold its ThinkPad brand to Lenovo, a Chinese producer. And essentially, if we look at the uh, microcomputer industry today, it's it's fairly competitive. We have big, low-cost producers selling computers at low price and low profits. Now, there's been a lot of turnover because profit margins tend to be slim, uh, but companies like HP, Lenovo, Dell, Acer um, have really taken over that manufacturing industry. And the dominance in the um, microcomputer era it was not the manufacturer, as it had been in the mainframe era, but it had been, um, it became right, Intel and Microsoft, neither of whom produced computers. Right? Intel producing the chip inside the computer, Microsoft producing the operating system. So we'll come back to Intel and microchips in a later video, but let me turn to software and look a little bit at the economics of software. So with software, nearly all costs are upfront cost. A big program will employ hundreds uh, of programmers working for several years, costing hundreds of millions of dollars or more. But the marginal cost is near zero. It costs almost nothing to replicate that, um, that program once it's been fully developed. And so this creates very large economies of scale. The more users you have, the more we can spread those setup costs across, um, across all the users, lowering the average cost. So big, big economies of scale here. And for some types of, off, of software, uh, particularly for operating systems, network externalities are also important. Again, network externalities say when we have more users, there are likely to be more applications, more programs in this case, um, and that will be then higher value to users. Putting these two together, economies of scale and network externalities, just like we had looked at earlier, is likely to result in a dominant firm. 
right? one firm who controls most of the market. And the dominant firm for PC, for microcomputer operating systems, was Microsoft. Uh, at its peak, Microsoft controlled um, around 95% of, oper of the operating system. And again, right, the operating system um, took advantage of the economies of scale in software production and took advantage of network externalities. Right? People preferred Microsoft offices and businesses preferred Microsoft because it worked with all the programs that they were interested in buying. Essentially, Microsoft gained a similar role that IBM had previously. So let's look a little bit at Microsoft's conduct, at its behavior, and see if we see any kind of uh, parallels to uh, the previous dominant firm in the mainframe industry. So one of the things that was interesting about Microsoft is that they used exclusionary licensing. So this is a kind of contracting. Um, so most Windows, um, or earlier than that, MS-DOS sales, were not to individuals, um, but to the computer manufacturers. And Microsoft's contracts were very restrictive. They would base the pricing on total productive capacity, right? and they would charge the manufacturer for every computer they shipped, whether or not that computer actually used a Microsoft product. So manufacturers had to pay for Windows even if they wanted to sell another operating system. And so that made it very um, difficult for other operating systems to compete. So the only people who um, could really offer uh, computers on a, uh, on a, um, without a Microsoft system were those who didn't offer any. And so that would be you know, very small market share uh, Apple, probably in the one well-known company from there, right? who were facing a very limited or restricted market because of those network externalities. Microsoft also required long-term contracts, which made a further barrier to new competition. A second issue with Microsoft is that there uh, were technical incompatibilities that made it difficult for other software manufacturers, other software producers to compete. So there were system flaws, or some people claim features, that made non-Microsoft programs uh, function poorly. So some of this had to do with documentation, and particularly not sharing the documentation of the APIs or the application programming interfaces. So that made it more difficult to write competing products, and Microsoft, because these were not documented, could change a specification without notice, which would then cause other programs to fail. There were even accusations of false error messages where developers using another uh, computer operating system, and there were a few that were trying to compete, would get a, a warning about incompatibilities and ask them to contact Microsoft. But there was no underlying true problem and that the developers who ignored the message found that the computer worked completely fine, um, but it was just another barrier put in their place, um, put in place by Microsoft. The third issue with Microsoft's behavior was bundling. Uh, and again, this gets close to tying that we talked about earlier. Microsoft bundled sales of computer operating systems, operating systems to um, to the applications. So if we look at the early days, Microsoft products were not the uh, programs that people were usually looking at. So the leading programs um, were by all non-Microsoft um, manufacturers. Um, so the, the big seller in word processing was WordPerfect, the big seller for spreadsheets was Lotus 1, 2, 3, and the most popular browser was Netscape. And the, the, the word processing and spreadsheets were very expensive, about $300 a program back in that day. What Microsoft did is bundle all these applications for a, a low price. Um, and of course, you, you know the, um, the names of these now, right? Is that WordPerfect was replaced by Word, 
um, Lotus 1, 2, 3 by Excel, um, Explorer displaced Netscape, uh, PowerPoint was introduced, and, and of course we now see them all as Microsoft Office. Um, and Microsoft Office it really became dominant. Um, and browsers, particularly, um, once in the Internet Explorer was bundled, Netscape, which had been the lead, um, really fell off the map. And essentially, Microsoft was accused of using its dominant position in operating systems to dominate the other categories of microcomputer software. Another accusation that may sound a little familiar um, is that Microsoft would pre-announce programs. Sometimes this would be called vaporware. Um, right? So when um, competitors had an advanced product, Microsoft would announce that they had one coming really soon, just wait, and that would often be enough to prevent customers from switching. switching. Also like IBM, Microsoft, while, while um, prosperous, um, being a very large company with lots of programmers on staff, it was very slow to move into new areas. Um, it was seen as a technological follower. Right? They were slow to get into the web. They were slow to get into music. So we see some aggressive behaviors, a dominant firm, and as you might expect, the um, this combination led to antitrust troubles. So in the early 90s, the Federal Trade Commission started an antitrust investigation of Microsoft's behavior, couldn't decide whether to pursue a case, um, but the antitrust division of the Department of Justice does take the case, and it is settled in 1994 with a consent decree. Microsoft agreed to modify its contract policies so that computer manufacturers only needed to pay for computers that were using Microsoft products, not on every single machine they produced. Um, the terms of contracts were shortened, um, and they were, um, Microsoft agreed to putting fewer restrictions on competing software developers, and they agreed something about tying. Now, the Department of Justice believed that bundling was banned by this agreement, but Microsoft's interpretation was different, and that led to a new antitrust case. And this was a major Section 2 monopolization case filed in 1998. So the Department of Justice alleged that Microsoft had taken um, its monopoly power and illegally used it to restrict competition and to hurt consumers. Uh, and 19 states joined um, the Department of Justice in filing the case against Microsoft. Now, the district course court finding was that Microsoft did act as a monopolist, that Microsoft violated Section 2 of the Sherman Act, um, and that it was guilty as charged. And in June of 2000, the district court ordered Microsoft to be broken up into two independent firms, an operating system uh, business that would have Windows, some handheld servers, and server operating systems, and then the applications business, which would have Office, Internet Explorer, uh, and some of the, the media, social media sites and websites that Microsoft was operating at that time. Um, and that all competing firms would have equal access to the manufacturers. Now, Microsoft did not like that finding, and they uh, appealed it. The Court of Appeals upheld the monopolization charge, so Microsoft was still guilty, but they reversed the breakup. They didn't think that was the appropriate punishment, and the case was returned to the district court with a new judge. Now, the other thing that happened um, is that we had a new administration in place. Um, George W. Bush had taken over. This was someone who had come in uh, is seen as very weak on antitrust, someone who only believed in price fixing, was not concerned about mergers or monopolization. And he, his um, antitrust authorities in the Department of Justice softened the case and even though Microsoft was already found guilty, they withdrew the tying charge. They said they would not seek um, breakup and they looked for some um, restrictions on Microsoft's conduct 
very similar to ones that had been in place from the earlier consent decree. So in 2001, the settlement between the new Department of Justice and Microsoft led to um, an agreement that Microsoft would provide access to the desktop for icons from rivals, that they would disclose technical specifications to developers, so that's the APIs or application protocol interfaces, um, that they have some access for rival operating systems and that they would not have exclusive contracts. Many analysts thought this was a victory for Microsoft despite having been found guilty. Critics said that the remedy is toothless and that Microsoft would be able to continue its abusive practices. Now, Microsoft did face uh, similar complaints in Europe um, the European Commissions um, also charged Microsoft with violating competition law, their competition law, and that they had illegally used their monopoly. Um, and they had, you know, again, on similar grounds around contracts, around secret interfaces, around tying. In 2004, Microsoft was found guilty and um, was ordered to pay large fines roughly $3.4 uh, $3 billion in fines, um, as well as to publish some of their technical code. There were also, as we mentioned in our antitrust um, section, private cases that were brought by um, companies and consumers who were uh, felt that they were hurt by Microsoft's action. Um, and so these were bought, brought by competitors and customers. And remember, private cases can result in treble damages. And the guilty finding, while it didn't break Microsoft up, the evidence from that case was able to be used in the civil cases, the private cases. Um, now, the private cases can't break up Microsoft, but it can be expensive for them to pay the damages. Um, in order to avoid court ordering three times damages, Microsoft settled many multi-million dollar payments. For instance, um, there was a Sun agreement, um, total of $1.6 billion paid by Microsoft in 2004, um, and about half of that was for antitrust and half of that was for a patent case. Um, AOL, who had purchased Netscape, got a $750 million payment in 2003, and Real Networks, um, the music player, got uh, a $460 million payment in fall of 2005. This has been Chuck Stahl talking about software, Microsoft, and Microsoft's antitrust troubles. Thank you for listening. This is Chuck from Kalamazoo College.